and we are recording. What is up? Awesome. How's it going today, man? <laughs> it's good, man. How you doing? Good. Hey, I want to thank you so much uh, for being on my show. Um, we are airing this uh, next week, and it's going to be our 100th interview anniversary, man. And, you know, I couldn't think of anybody better to put on the 100th interview anniversary but you, man. So, Dude, well, I appreciate that. Very honored. Hey, Chris. So, first off, before we get into the interview, man, I want to say that um, – that you and 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 Bam and um, and Ryan and Deco, you guys were all my childhood, man. You know what I mean? Like, like <laughs> I remember being like twelve years old and like smoking pot for the first time, and like and like and like watching CKY, dude. And I remember it was just the funniest shit I've ever seen in my entire life. And I remember like uh, me and my friends, like I'm 31 now, you know, and, yeah, yeah. and as kids. Um, we used to religiously watch you guys, you know, and, you know, back in the day when like you, you had to like buy the tapes, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. Like, like, hell like, yeah. like, 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 like we call a friend over and we'd be like, man, like, uh, get a half eighth of pot and bring over your tapes, man. You know, <laughs> <laughs> a lot of half eighth. That's hilarious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Remember those days? <laughs> oh dude. Hell yeah. Well, it was funny when you, uh, when you said when you first smoked pot, I, I have a funny story of like the first time I ever smoked pot. Was, yeah. at a Cypress, was at a Cypress Hill concert. And then all these years later, after doing the CKY, Jackass, People of Bam, I ended up meeting Be Real and smoking a joint with them. And it was like, <laughs> dude, this is the fucking raddest moment. You know, like for me, I felt like that because I was like, dude, I love their music. And, and it was the first time I ever smoked weed. And then it all came full circle. But that's funny. Uh, I'm sober these days or I would smoke a joint with you. <laughs> hey, what? Um, Chris, uh, I, I'm sober these days too, man. Oh, awesome. Congratulations. Yeah, dude. No, I think, uh, you know, getting older, it's it's really, uh, it's it's a good idea to uh, keep your head clear, you know, because, you know, uh, it, it isn't like we're little when we're like, we're able to like burn all these brain cells, you know, and still, <laughs> and still function, you know, now it's like, uh, if, if I were to smoke, I'd be spacing out looking at a candy bar for an hour, you know? <laughs> Hell yeah. No, I feel that for sure, man. <laughs> but that dude, um, I grew up watching you guys, dude. Um, I remember when I first got a hold of you. Um, I called my my best friend Justin, and 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 I, and he was like, and I was like, dude, guess who I'm gonna interview? And he's like, who? And I was like, ah, Kiki, ah. <laughs> and he's like, and he's like, he's like, no fucking way, man, no fucking way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that's awesome, dude. It's so funny that that skit that we did with the Kiki thing. Like, Bam and I kept doing that voice to the cat. And we videoed it, and, and as we were editing it, we are like, I, I think we're the only ones that think this is funny. Like, because we were, like, kind of delirious as we were editing it, and uh, he just kept putting this more dramatic music to it, and it was just fucking funny. And ended up being something that people know me for, which, like, who would have known that, that, you know, that, that we are just fucking around with the cat, and that ended up being something. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's awesome, man. So, dude, um, one thing I love, too, man, is that you know I've been watching your podcast bathroom break, and I, I was watching um, your interview with uh, with Phil and April, and, and I loved how you guys were like talking about your childhood, you know, hanging out with all the guys, you know, everybody being really young and growing up. Um, um, when you guys were all really young, when did the idea come of like starting to like record these videos, and 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 actually like try to make like some entertainment? Because I'm sure before the videos, you guys were just like fun guys, you know, and then you, were you guys just like hey, let's just turn on a camera. Yeah, like we were a bunch of hellions from the beginning, you know, and uh, and, and the, the, the the like kind of the start of all of it was Bam skateboarding uh, because he, like he was just a skateboarding prodigy from the beginning. You know, all of us are trying to learn like an ollie and this dude's like launching off the, the roof into like a mini ramp, you know? So when we were super small, he was like that. His dad bought a big VHS camera, you know, those big ones that had like the VHS tapes in it. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they look like a movie camera, but really it's just this like piece of crap. So he, he, uh, Phil had that and he used to use that to, to record BAM skateboarding, basically for like a sponsor me video sort of thing. And uh, because we weren't as good at skateboarding, when we wanted to be on the video, we'd do stupid shit that like, got us you know got the camera pointed at us and uh and and ryan you know he he always like tried to ride a bmx bike but none of us were were like 
at that level, you know, like where Bam was. So it was like he, he would do stupid shit, like just wipe his ass with a glove and sniff it, like stupid things. And, and they were just little like dumb shit when we were kids, you know. But setting up a trampoline outside of like the Margera's house, we could jump off the roof for the roof onto the trampoline, but we couldn't jump <laughs> off with a skateboard, but we just jumped and then fuck ourselves up. So it just kind of sort of evolved like that. And uh, and then just kept being and Bam basically saved every bit of footage, you know, so he always just would video it, never tape over it and just save every bit of footage. And it was years later that he basically said, you know, I want to put together a video of all of this stuff. And so he he put together a video and edited it, and that was the first CKY. And that yeah. was basically because Landspeed, his company, was looking to put out a skate video, and he had all this skate footage, and he was like, dude, but I, I want to save my footage for this video that I'm making <laughs> and put that all together. And that's what became the first CKY video. Dude, that's sweet, dude. So, you know, um, one thing I noticed, like, me and my friends watching all your videos, it's not like, you know, after the first CKY video got really popular, um, what was the thought process like recording CKY 2K, CKY 3, and then Haggard? Did you guys think like you guys just had to top the movie before and do some like crazier stunts? Because I remember that one yeah. stunt, uh, that one stunt you and Don did uh, with uh, the what is it, the, the what is it the fucking uh, uh, jock straps? Uh, yeah, yeah, out yeah. Of the dude. You know, yeah, and I, 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 I just, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was just like <laughs> like man like these guys are going off like like what was the thought process after like the first video was getting a lot of traction like to do the next ones yeah i think that like it, it was crazy because the first one was like i said a, like a collection of stuff from over the years and 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 then when the second one happened there was still extra footage and uh and we were we were starting to try to top ourselves um and, and it did, it got to that point where we just had this thing for the film. We would always say for the film. And it was just, whatever is like stopping you from trying the next craziest thing, just think about it. It's going to be so worth it for the film. You know, it's going to make it so much better if you just say fuck it and jump off the roof. Or if you say fuck it and get hit by the car. Or if you tie your bike to a tree and ride as fast as you can. Like these things, they just started to escalate because we thought, the more we push ourselves, the better the film's going to turn out. So it just for the film, for the film. And we'd always like do this whole like singing along thing that we would do and get each other psyched for it. And, and I think we had a great way of amping each other up to go to that next level. You know, like Dunn was the dude who was fearless and he was just ready to go for anything. But once in a while he would, he would be like hesitant and we could get him to be like, all right, let's do it. It's going to be so rad, dude. It's, it's so worth it. Like, he did this waterfall thing that he you could tell he was nervous about it, but he just, like, we just were like, dude, it's going to be so worth it. And then once he did it, he was so psyched that he did it. You know, and, and there was all those kind of moments like that where, where each other would hype each other up. And not not in, like, a lame way, because sometimes I think, you know, and it's, it's probably wrong to say this, but when, when MTV got involved in certain things like that, like, there'll be people that don't get what we're doing, and they'll be like, come on, just do it. And you're like, Dude, we're about to fuck ourselves up real bad. Yeah. Like, don't, um, you know, don't try to pressure that situation. That's how you get hurt. You know, just wait till the adrenaline's flown and we're ready to do it and we'll do it. And that, that, that was later down the line. In the beginning, it was just each other amping each other up and knowing what each other's limitations were. Like, Bam was, was, was gnarly. Like, he was going to do, like, a flip off of a six-story hotel into a pool. And you're like, damn, dude, like, I would never do that. But he would, so like getting him psyched for it is like if that's just kind of the way we did it. You know what each other's strengths were and what each other was was willing to do. Like I was always willing to take a shit off of something. I was always willing to like run around naked or do something stupid like that. And so then they would amp me up to do it. You know, like if you're about to drive seventy miles an hour down the road and hang your ass out the window to shit, you're kind of <laughs> nervous. Like, am I gonna fall out of the window or what? You know? And they would be like, "Dude, Brad, you got it. You fuck it. It's gonna be so fucking funny." You know? And then then you do it and it and it's and it and it turns out to be gold you know uh, no absolutely dude and uh you know um i couldn't imagine just because like with like uh with a jackass coming along i know that means like more dollar signs and more money and i and, and like like uh, to a point that you were saying you know i think a lot of people in that industry 
um, all they think is about the dollar signs and, and, you know, the type of reaction and money they might make off somebody hurting themselves. But like you said, you, you don't ever know how, how bad people hurt themselves, you know, which, uh, yeah. which, which comes to one of my next questions. Um, um, was, was there a stunt that you ever did that, that you really hurt yourself? I remember, I remember just like watching like your, you know, of course the famous bungee wedgie and all that, where you felt like <laughs> face first into the ground, you know what I mean? And then all yeah. of a sudden you fell again. There's like a shitty jack stra- a jock strap, but I don't know. But uh, but yeah, um, what, it, what, it ripped my butthole. It ripped my butthole. Like I was bleeding out of my butthole. Oh my god! Was <laughs> um, um was, was that your cra- was that was that your craziest stunt, or was there ever a stunt that like uh you really hurt yourself, but but that you didn't really show on camera how hurt you were? Yeah, there, there was a bunch of those. Um, there there was one time when we were with uh, the Bloodhound Gang, and we were doing this thing for one of the CKYs. And, uh, like I was a little bit, not a little bit, I was totally drunk and, uh, and I got in the shopping cart and I think it was either evil Jared, I think it was evil Jared or Jimmy pop. I think it was evil Jared pushed me so hard that I like on the, uh, on the shopping cart that went flying and hit the curb, bounced off the ground, but then smacked the back of my head on this soda machine. And it was like the, the metal part of the soda machine and I got a concussion from it. And, uh, and like, you know, I had so many concussions. I had a concussion doing the, the Haggard, uh, filming of that when I dropped in. Cause the funny part is, is I could drop in on that ramp, but I had to fake fall and make it look real. So I couldn't be fake and lame. So I just full step forward and just lay, let everything go. And I smacked my head off the ramp, got a concussion. Um, but yeah, that one with the bloodhound gang was pretty gnarly. Cause I just wasn't ready for it. And like my head just smacked that that like the metal part of the the soda machine was so you know like that was not very forgiving. <laughs> so uh, so that hurt like hell. Um, I had I broke a tailbone uh, in a shopping cart. Shopping carts were not my friend. I I tore my rotator cuff on the on the very first episode of Jackass, uh, launching off this this little uh, quarter quarter pipe or whatever it was uh, not quarter pipe but a little launch ramp, and uh, and. The funny thing about that was I thought that the ramp was too far away from the bushes and Bam's the pro pro skateboarder. So I should have trusted him. He was like, nah, dude, that's in the right spot. Like just leave it there. And I was like, no, I don't think so. So I moved it up a little bit. He's like, all right. And then I was like, okay. And he, he pushes and I flew over the bush, totally cleared the bush. And I was like all the way upside down. So when I put my arms out, I just like ripped my arm out of the socket Totally oh my. tore my rotator cuff, and uh, that one was on camera, and you could see how bad it was because I ended up in the hospital. And they, they like you would think they have a better way of doing it, but they just basically strap you with this strap and then just rip your arm back into the, the socket, and it's like ah, it hurts like hell. Um, but yeah, there's there's so many of those. There's one where uh, I I tied a bike to a tree. And then uh, rode as fast as I could and flew over the handlebar. And and the first one, like I ate shit, you know, I ate shit. It looked good, and I was like, all right, that's it. And then Bam was kind of like, oh, dude, let's do one for safety, you know, just so we have it. And I always hated that phrase of like, do one for safety. Like this is not safe at all, <laughs> you, you know. And it's like this is definitely not safe. So so I tie it again and I ride. And as soon as um. As soon, as soon as I rode, like, full speed, I flew over the handlebars and separated my right shoulder. So I had already torn my left rotator cuff. Then I separated my right shoulder, and Bam's like, oh, dude, the first one was better. I'm like, the first one was better? Like, I, I just <laughs> ripped my arm out of, you know, I just tore my, or I just separated my shoulder for for nothing. And then we used the first one. You know, and then you're like, fuck. <laughs> You know, so there's so many of those things that happen like that where you just got beat up. And uh, sorry, I don't know. Am I allowed to curse? Because I, I uh... honestly, uh, I, I'm playing your interview after 10 p.m. So uh, on okay. 10 p.m. 10 p.m. on FM radio, um, we're allowed to curse. Okay, cool, cool. Sorry, I was saying the f word a few times. <laughs> no, no, it's totally fine, dude. And you know, like I, like I was saying earlier, I dude, I love the skits um, with like uh, uh, you and Deco, like in Hag in Haggard and stuff, dude. Um, yeah. But one thing I love about CKY is that um, Dunn had a completely different personality. You had a different personality. D 
Deco had a different personality. You had Bam. You you had Rake Yon. You know, I love Rake. <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> he loves that heavy metal shit. Yeah, you know, I, I, I love how you guys all had your different personalities, dude. Um, um, if, if you could describe each person, starting with Rake Yon in one paragraph, could you do that with each person? Uh, let's see. Rake, Rake uh, has a has has uh, basically Rake Jan, I mean, he he's the mad scientist. You know, he he's he actually is a scientist. He's a brilliant dude, but he's also like this heavy metal scientist. You know, like always has the hair. Still does. It's now turning gray and whitish. So he's actually like the the legit mad scientist with the crazy hair. And uh, Brandon said this funny thing one time about his teeth. He was like. Dude, it looks like you are just chewing up cars at the junkyard. You know, <laughs> with his mouth, because his teeth are so fucking mangled. But, uh, but that, you know, Raytheon is the mad scientist, one hundred percent. All right, how about how about uh, Deco? Uh, dude, I mean, Deco is is honestly the the best comedic mind I've ever known in my life. And and I I at this point I'm a camera guy and I work on sets all the time and I work on shows with big time people and. Um, you know, not to be like that, but big time comedians, people, people know, and I still believe he's the, he's the greatest comedic mind that I've ever been around. That's that's awesome, dude. Um, um, and how about um, uh, Mr. The Legend himself, Mr. Dunn? Um, he he's the dude that'll just go for it. You know, he he's the guy that when everybody else is kind of chickening out, he he will step it up and make it happen. We, we always laugh because he, he had about 37 different companies that he was starting. He was always like this dreamer, you know, like, oh, I'm going I'm gonna to do race cars. I'm going to do, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to do fabrication. I'm going to do car series. I'm going to do that. And he's always like doing that kind of thing. And I think he found where he fit in the Jackass crew because uh, because he always just went for it. There was ne there was nothing ever stopping him from 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 trying to get the best footage there was. And and uh, dude. The funniest, like, he, he's such a witty dude, you know? Like, like Brandon's this comedic mind that will bring out these characters and create all these things off the cuff, where Ryan will just say the funniest shit like that, like the snappiest, funniest <laughs> comment. I, I, I was, uh, and, and, he, and he'd call you on your shit, too. I was talking about this the other day with a friend where I had this really bad tattoo on my leg, and I, like, drew it when I was 18 years old, and, and I was like, oh, I want to get this tattoo. And I get it. And then, like, okay, after we get some recognition from the shows, we're down in Cancun doing that MTV Spring Break. And these, like, really good-looking girls come up, and they're all, hey, how's it going? And, oh, what's the tattoo? And I was like, man, I just I picked it off a wall there. And Ryan's like, no, you didn't. You drew that stupid fucking thing. And then, like, embarrassed the shit out of me in front of everybody. But he was that dude that would just call you on your shit, you know, like, wouldn't let you be some fake ass trying to be, like, Hollywood and be like, what's up, dude? Yeah, this what's going on? He's like, shut up, rap. You know, like immediately, like never, never fake, never trying to, to, to trying to like play into whatever the image is. He was just himself, like a hundred percent. Dude, I love that. So, and, uh, and last, um, how about Mr. Bam Argera? Um, and before we get into Bam, um, I couldn't imagine how much stress he was under trying to, you know, uh, you know, always get the uh, the guys together or like, you know, doing the videotaping and all that. Um, how, how would you describe him in a paragraph? Dude, uh, like I would say uh, ju just so disciplined. You know, um, when we were growing up, we, we uh, you know, it, it was a time where skateboarding was looked at as you're, you're the punk kid, you know, you're, you're, you're not, you're going nowhere with this. And he had this motivation and this, this determination to just, excel at it and he he was so disciplined with it it was day in day out he's going out to get a photo going out to try a trick and do that stuff and that um you know translated into the cky stuff he he had that same discipline with editing the footage and staying with it we'd all be out partying and he'd be like nah dude i gotta get this stuff edited i gotta get this put together i'm working on this music video or i'm working on that and, and so much discipline in that and that's he was the mastermind of the CKY stuff, and that's what what led to everything kind of getting, you know, the recognition that it has because because of his skateboarding, because of his commitment to it, and the determination to make it work. Dude, um, that's awesome, dude. Yeah, um, you, you guys are quite the group, man. You guys are you guys are like a superhero team, dude. And um, <laughs> so, 
So uh, one thing I was always curious about when I used to watch Viva La Bam is like, was, uh, you know, did you guys just like wake up in the morning and was like, all right, like the TV crews had to be here and we just got to have like an awesome day plan or like, how, how was that whole shooting? Like when like you guys would do Viva La Bam, like at his house and you guys would go around, like, like what was like the pre-production for that? Well, that, that, by that point, that show was a lot more structured than what we did with CKY. You know, so CKY was more like what you're saying, where we would like, we'd sleep over at somebody's house or whatever was happening and be like, dude, we got to get up and film this thing. Like we, we'd have like a, a, an idea of something, but sometimes when you were out just hanging out the night before, you'd come up with something really funny that you want to do the next day and you'd go film it. Um, with Viva La Bam, there was a whole like, Crew, there was a whole crew there, like a, like basically Hollywood came in and it made it like this different thing. There, it was it was done like a structure of making a of making like a TV show, you know, like a regular Hollywood show kind of. Everybody's sitting down. There's pre production. There's writers meetings. There's things about what we're going to try to do. And and so with that show, we would all sit together and a couple of the producers would sit down and jot notes and we'd come up and we'd just sit and riff with 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 stuff like. Oh, dude, we're gonna launch the the Hummer off of this quarry, or we're gonna do this, and, <laughs> like just just things that you're like, oh, we should get a pirate ship, you know, and we should do this, like just just like throwing random ideas out, and and the producers would help structure those random ideas into a storyline to make it make sense of okay, okay, Don Vito's uh, little side story here, or don't feed Phil, but we got to have something going on with April while that's happening. What can we do with April? Oh. Well, well, you know, uh, Ryan had this idea for to do for April for this other thing. We that can work here, you know, and just kind of structuring it like that. So there was a lot more planning that went into that show for sure. Obviously, there's a bunch of money involved. MTV's got their their hands in it, and they want to know what's happening, you know. Where before with the CKY, we had the freedom of like, Bam is basically the boss, so we're just gonna do what we're gonna do, and then he'll be like, Shoot, okay, we need this thing to fill in here. And then we'll put that together and then that'll complete the edit, you know, like where with MTV, they, like, lawyers want to know, because if you're trying something too crazy, they want to make sure that, you know, it's legal and then it's standards and practices and like all that stuff kind of kind of comes into play. Dude, yeah, no, I, I completely agree, man. I think that goes on with like everything, like even like being like a fine musician, you know, where you have to follow yeah, exactly. certain protocol, certain rules, uh, certain spending. Uh, you only can do certain interviews, certain press, you know, it's, it's really yeah, close. Exactly. To it. It's funny um, that, that you brought up uh, Don Vito, man. Uh, Don Vito is like, yo, you know, yo. <laughs> like, get some nice girls. yo, yo, I did. I, lo I love that information of uh, uh, Bam's uncle, dude. Um, um, so did you guys um, always like talk and uh, hang out with Don Vito, like in the CKY days before he tried to get you put on TV? Yeah, because because Bam's family was always in the mix. Like we, we, we went and we would like the hangout was April and Phil's house. You yeah. Know? And so like Booth and Vito, like Phil's uh, brother and sister, like they were always around Kevy and Pat and like and Belinda. They're all there. Um, just the family was always close and they're around and cousins were around and stuff. So Vito was always there and he always had these crazy stories about life and the things that he was doing and stuff. So it was just, just like a natural fit to just start putting him on camera because he would be talking and then Bam would just be sitting there like, I, I need to go grab the camera, you know, like, and then just get the <laughs> camera and put it on him and, and it would just be funny stuff. So it just, it was a natural progression that he kind of got into the mix. Yeah, dude, uh, that's awesome, dude. You know, and that's what I love about all of you guys and, um, you know, April, Phil and Don and all that, you know, like watching, watching everybody for 20 plus years. You know, it's almost like it's almost like you become a connection because like uh, you grow up uh, like we grew up while you guys were growing up, you know? Yeah. 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 I always say that, like, you know, a lot of the, a lot of my favorite bands are always bands that I, I grew up with because I got to grow up with, you know, as much as I love Metallica, when I got into Metallica, they were seven albums in, you know, but like, yeah. but like guys, when I first got into you guys, I mean, I was I was 12 years old. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah. And, 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 and back in the day, you know, there wasn't a lot of internet or all that. So like, so when I used to put when we used to put your guys on, you guys were like the most extreme thing we've ever seen. You know? Yeah, 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 exactly. You know, and it's funny because you say that like 
I, I thought about like when we uh, when we started to get recognition and we started meeting like celebrity people and stuff. So there was a lot of times where I was like, I don't care. But Neil Fallon from Clutch to me, like he, like I loved Clutch. Jess Margera turned me on to it. I loved them. They weren't even some like super famous band, but when I met him, I was nervous. I was like, oh, oh hey, you know, like, and, and you, you meet like Sean Penn that's like, what's up, man? But but then you meet <laughs> Neil Fallon, you're like, ew, because I grew up with it. I grew up with that music and that meant a lot to me, you know? So so then you kind of get that nerve of like, oh, uh, holy shit, that's Neil Fallon right there. And other people are like, who? You know? And you're like, dude, that band means the world. They're awesome. And uh, and I get that. I get, I get the idea of growing up together too. And I, I always thought that uh, that CKY, Jackass, Evil of Bam, all that stuff was a success because everybody was doing it. We just happened to have a camera on us. Everybody was with their group of friends doing stupid shit and, and, and everyone could relate to that. And I think that's why it turned out to be successful because everyone could relate and everybody was doing it. Anytime that I went out and toured with a rock band on the bus, it was the same shit. It was the same exact like, Dude, somebody's lighting their ass hairs on fire, and then somebody's like spitting something out the side of the of the bus, you know, or whatever. Like, there's always something crazy going on, and it just felt like it fit so well. And I think that's why people took to it, you know. Dude, that's awesome, dude. Um, one of the questions I always like to ask when I um uh, when I talk when I talk to like uh people in metal bands is like, um, was there a moment in your career with like doing the people of the band? Uh, Jackass and CKY, where like you're just like, holy crap, guys! Like, I think we're making something like really big and really special. Was there like maybe like certain attention you got, or maybe a, like a certain moment where where it, it became more of like, wow, like this is like a big career shift. Like, was there like a moment or like a movie where that happened and it just blew away, like just took yeah. off? I think that um, th th there was. There was little moments along the way, but like um, CKY2K, people started to know who we were in our town, you know? And it was funny because the one dude, uh, Chris Aspate, he's a skateboarder. He uh, kind of got the nickname Hoof, like Hoof Pate, because in one of the CKYs, he like duct taped his hands or whatever, and it looked like a hoof. And um, he's the one that gave me the nickname Rab himself. And, uh, and it was because of that, like, like we basically, we went to a party and CKY 2K had just come out and people were starting to kind of like know who we were and that we were filming this stuff. And he was like, Oh, there he is. Chris Rab himself live and in person, you know? And, and, uh, and then that became hilarious. And then he was doing it to Dunn too. He was like, Ryan Dunn himself. The celebrity is in the house, you know, and like just making fun of us because people were starting to know it. And uh, and for some reason, himself stuck to my name. And it was just Rab himself from then on, like Rab himself, live and in person. And uh, so that was like the first little indication that people were starting to like know who we were, you know, because we it was this was in our town, in our small town. But but they, but it started circulating in skate shops and people started to know what it was. And then when somebody was recognizing you, like, dude. Didn't you do that thing where you pulled all the stuff off the shelf in the gro grocery store? And I'm like, yeah, you know, and, um, and, and once that started to happen, you're like, oh, wow, this, like, people were taking notice to this. Um, and then, of course, Jackass was like that, that thing that, like, you've been doing it for a while, but it seems like overnight success. You know, like, as soon as the show happened, then all of a sudden, like, who are these people and all this? And you, and you get this, like, international um, exposure. And that was like, whoa this is crazy because i think when we started filming that show like knoxville and tremaine came out and i didn't know who they were at the time they, they were dudes from big brother skate magazine you know so they, that's what they were some dudes from skate magazine and I've, I've been around so many people from skate magazines because of bam but once we filmed that we thought like oh this will be a pilot show they say it's going to go on mtv whatever and then it goes on and i'm sitting with some of my friends at college and they're like dude you're on tv right now and i'm like what like it, and it was starting to be like oh my god like this is crazy and then they ordered all the next episodes and then you're like this is like insane that this is like becoming this thing and then when then when you get like when rolling stone shows up to westchester pennsylvania to take photos with knoxville and bam and me and dunn and brandon and Ray, 
that was like, oh my God, dude. Knoxville is going to be on the cover of Rolling Stones magazine and we're going to be inside it. Like, that's insane. Like, that was those moments where you're like, dude, this is like getting real. Like, this is starting to like take off, you know? And uh, and, and it was so much fun, man. It was, it was so exciting and, and, and cool at that time. I was just some kid from a small town who was going to college and I thought, oh, we filmed these things because it's funny. We had no idea that it would ever, ever get onto a TV or, or on Rolling Stones or, or like any of that. And, and it's just, you know, it was a hell of a ride. Dude, I, I love it, man, dude. And uh, I love hearing your story because now I just, I already feel closer to you, man, and to everything that I grew up watching, man. So oh, I, awesome. I, I, I appreciate hearing all of this, dude. So um, now um, I want to talk about like uh, what's going on nowadays. So you have your podcast, Bathroom Break. And also an organization called Hope for Today. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. So uh, let, let's start with Hope, uh, Hope for Today. So, uh, so Hope for Today is, uh, is a nonprofit organization that's based on uh, community outreach. Basically, we're just trying to you know, improve situations in the community. And uh, we focus mainly in Haiti, uh, in a town called Ransomble. Uh It's outside of St. Mark. It's kind of uh, on the western coast you know, uh, of Haiti. And um, really the way that that came about was uh, I'm a camera guy at this point. That's my day job. That's what I've been doing is, is holding the camera. And, uh, and that's what I've been filming, you know, the jackass stuff um, before the pandemic happened. But, uh, but what I'm doing is, you know, running around with a camera and a buddy of mine said, Hey, you want to do this documentary in Haiti? And I was like, yeah, sure. He's like, you ever been there? I was like, nah he's like dude it's gnarly so i was like okay so i go and it is gnarly like it, it's there it's it, it's a really tough kind of uh world down there, there there's a well, lot um, of um a quick little question so you know how like here in the united states we see all this media and we see how bad it is in other places is, is it is, is it really that bad like over there or worse y yes it's worse than you think i think because like you can't I, I feel like you can't understand it until you go there like like you see it on the news and, and we're kind of um, we're kind of like desensitized to that stuff, you know, at this point, because we're just inundated with so much information and and so much like, you know, so many issues and, and things like that in the world. But when you get there, then you really like feel it and sense it and, and kind of know what's going on. And and when I went there to do that documentary, it was basically to expose the fact that a lot of nonprofit organizations will uh, allocate the, the funds in an inappropriate way so a lot of the money that's that they're gaining is not being put to good use and there was like warehouses full of food that was not being distributed to people and and it's just kind of the, the way that everything is structured is it's it's damaging the economy more than it's helping and you know i think that the the heart is in the right place when you when when, when they're doing that it's not like there's these evil people it's the heart's in the right place but it's hard to understand what's going to help and what's going to hurt. And I think it's like that, that, that mindset of teach a man to fish rather than give a man to fish. So when yeah. you give them that, it kind of just deteriorates the situation. But when you, when you, when you're, when you're educating and showing ways to uh, maintain sustainability, then you're, you're able to kind of help them. And that's what happened during that documentary. I saw that this, one of the, the hosts said, Hey man, there's, $300 million is being misallocated. If somebody came here with like $10,000, it would make more of a difference than this. And I, that's when the light bulb went off. And I was like, I need to do that. You know, like I need to get 10 grand together and come back down here and, and just help local farmers buy some of their crops, do that, and, and, and then bring that over to the locals and doing that stuff. And that's what I did for the first go was do that. And then it's evolved into what do they need in this town? They needed a bathroom because of the sewage was running off into the drinking water and then they're getting cholera and bacteria and then they're dying from the cholera. And so uh, it was like, what is, what is needed? And, and the way that we work it is that the community leaders in there, the local Haitians, we allocate the funds to them. They spearhead the projects that need to be done and they hire local Haitians to do it. So they're all self-sustainable and they're doing, the, the, they're, in, they're improving the environment but when you're a local Haitian, you're seeing the community leader do it. You're feeling like this. You're feeling a pride and like this is our this is what our work and what we've done. When you see some white dude from from 
America coming down and being like, hey, let me fix it. I just want to get a photo so everyone knows I'm great. You know, like that is, is so destructive. And and so our our goal with Hope for Today is to continue to just be – we're very close. We have a bunch of friends that are local Haitians down there. And, uh, and, and I got set up with a mentor who he went to go there to live there for three months, and he ended up there for 10 years. He's, he's fluent wow. in language. And he's a godfather to a bunch of the kids there. And, and he has such an amazing relationship with so many people. He brought me into his inner circle and, and introduced me to them. And we just kind of learned to love one another. And we get awesome messages from each other. Like, I love you. Congratulations. Like, we just had a baby. They're like congratulating me on the baby and, and just awesome. sending love and, and during holidays and all that stuff. And it's been so rewarding because, um, and I always say this, they get way more, I get way more out of it than they, than they do. You know, I, I get so much out of out of being able to connect with them, and then you know the little projects that we've done, like I said, the bathroom, the classrooms, the the irrigation systems, and 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 the water filtrations, and and things like that that we're doing, are great, and 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 they're they're helpful. But um, but I'm not sure. I, I, like I said, I feel like I get a lot more out of it because I get to get to to meet these people and get close with these people, and and it's so awesome. Yeah, I uh, I agree, man, a hundred percent with that. And I think that's absolutely beautiful and amazing what you're doing. And I think that um, I love that you're able to recognize the things that are um, happening right and the things that are happening wrong. And, you know, I, I, I could probably imagine with like, you know, being in the entertainment business and entertainment, uh, entertaining so much and making people laugh, you know, it, it, it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, you're, you're benefiting people by making them laugh. But like when you're actually helping people real time, it's almost like uh, it was almost like a completely different you're just mind blown all over again in life. And you're just like, you know, I could, I could, I don't know. I'm, I'm not speaking for you, but maybe for me, but uh, it's like, it's like, man, like entertaining, entertaining for so long and doing all these videos and, you know, and, you know, getting all this attention for it, but you know, $10 to like a kid in another country by buying them lunch makes the most massive difference. So um, l let me tell, I don't, I don't, I'm not trying to, I'm going to tell you a small story for me really quick. Yeah. Um, um, when I was 12 years old, I went to Mexico for the first time. And before I went to Mexico, um, I was a spoiled kid, you know. I had like a like a $160 skateboard deck, you know, best bearings, yeah. best wheels, you know what I mean? Dark star deck, um, like uh, like a hundred dollar like skateboard shoes. Um, I would always ask my parents for like the, the all the games for the Sega Dreamcast, you know, when I yeah. used to be <laughs> back in the day, you know. And I remember, like, um, I used to always ask my parents and never realize that, like, they used to work hard, you know, because both of my parents are immigrants. And I remember going to Mexico. My mom gave me, like, a handful of pesos. And I went down to the uh, middle of the town. And I remember I saw a, a little kid, no sh uh, no shoes, just shorts and a tank top. And uh, he was standing next to a, a empty taco cart that was uh, chained to a pole, you know. And I remember walking up to him. And I'm like, hey, uh, uh, and, and you see me. I'm a $200 outfit riding on my $150 skateboard and, and I'm just, and like being spoiled and just completely um, um, brainwashed, you know, by the American dream. And I'm just yeah. like, like, what are you doing? You know? And, and he's like, Oh, I'm, I'm watching the cart. I'm like, you're watching the cart. He's like, and I was like, but you're a kid. Why are you watching the cart? And he's like, he's like, well, um, the guy who owns the cart told me that he'll feed me tonight. If I watch it for the whole day, you know? And, and, and when yeah. that happened, when that happened, my mind blew. It, it was almost like a cord was cut from my head. And I was like, oh, my God, this kid is my age. And he and he's going to sit here for eight hours to eat three tacos that night. And I'm over here complaining that I don't have the next set, uh, Dreamcast game. And, I, and I'm <laughs> complaining about skateboards and all this. And I'm just like, wow, I've been lost this entire time, you know, because, like, I was glued to a TV. At, you know the advertisements oh i want the newest this i want the newest that and when that happened i was like oh my god like like what type of life have i been living where i'm not even thankful to my parents and this kid doesn't have parents and he's watching a taco cart you know yeah. ever since that happened i came back to the united states and i was just like you know um i started being more thankful to my parents you know and i, and I was just like mom and dad i'm sorry like you know, like I was, I, and, and that was me being a twelve-year-old thinking that way. I was like, you know, like in my head, I was like, I was a spoiled brat, it, dude. And that, that's amazing that you had the insight to be able to see that because so many people might just look at that kid and walk by, but the fact that you just asked, like, 
that changed your whole perspective on on life in itself. And and that's amazing, you know, to to take that second to 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 have compassion for somebody else and understand what they're going through. And and I think that that's so important, you know, and it's so important to do that. And, and like you said, it changed your life. It changed your perspective. Like, dude, I don't need that Dreamcast game. I, like, this kid's just trying to get three tacos. Like, whoa, that 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 puts things into perspective on like a whole nother level. And I, I I sort of had like you know not not a similar not the same experience, but but I got to see what it's like in Brazil. Um, Bob Burnquist is uh you know like amazing skateboarder, yeah, and he brought us. Yeah, and he he brought us down there for uh, Viva La Bam and showed us, you know, how people were living and and what he does for them for his hometown is amazing. He'll bring skateboards, clothes, all these things, and give them out to the kids that want to learn to skate. And all these kids, like yeah, like you said, they don't have shoes, they don't have this. They're skating in bare feet, and he's like putting shoes on their feet and doing that stuff. And the stuff that he does is amazing for 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 his hometown because it's close to him and and. And, and, and it makes such a difference. And, and, and until you see those things firsthand, it's easy to be in our little bubble and, and in our little comfortable bubble of what we have, you know, in our lives. I, I grew up, I had a nice childhood that like I never wanted for anything. And, and you know, and, and you, you lose sight of that until you can kind of get there and firsthand see it for yourself. And, that's what happened for me in Haiti because of that documentary. You know, I, I think I was just cruising along not and, and, and not as grateful as I could be, you know, for the things that I've had in life and sometimes getting frustrated with all those other things. And it's not to say that we don't do that and we won't do that, but, but we need those little reminders from time to time. And that's, that's what that organization is about is, is just doing that having those little reminders, but also just connecting with humans. And, and I've seen some of the people that, that you think, are are in the in the in the toughest situations they have the most faith in in life and and they're happy and they're out like playing music together and dancing and joking and loving it and i'm like man you know i i was worried that they didn't have soy milk at at starbucks or some stupid thing you know because that'll happen on like on set like people will be like there's no soy milk and you're like oh my god you know like and, but like these people make the best of life and, and, and they've reminded me that so much that, that, that life is all that, of what you make and it's not about what you have that's going to make you happy. It's about, you know, from within and, and that kind of stuff. And, and those are those kind of amazing moments that I get to have being down in Haiti. Dude, that is so, that is so beautiful, man. Um, I don't want to take too much of your, uh, more of your time, but um, so tell me about like um, you, you said right now that, that you're working with like comedians. And um, you know, doing a lot of videos. So, um, what's what what's a normal day for uh, Chris Rob? <laughs> uh, right now, during the pandemic, a normal day is I'm a, I'm a Mr. Mom. So my wife and I had a had a baby in December, and uh, our oh, daughter's hey. like eight months old now. Hey, so congrats, man! I, I had my son in January. So. Oh, dude! Congrats! Is that your first or? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Congratulations. That's rad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah so so that's been that's been life these days is being mr mom you know uh 220 221 whatever it takes <laughs> but uh but no man we uh we we've been uh you know been very fortunate to be able to have a lot of time with our daughter uh during these times um but yeah aside from the pandemic and and what happened because basically the pandemic shut studios down so i've been out of work most of the year um and before that what i was doing uh, I'm a camera guy, so I'm in the union, the local 600, and uh, and what I do is I work on all different types of projects. Um, Jackass, we were starting to shoot before uh, the you know the the pandemic went down, and I think every I think that's public knowledge, so I'm allowed to talk about it. Obviously, I won't talk about specifics, but funny ass shit. Um, and uh, and then uh, prior to that, I was working on a show called Schooled. Um, which is like a spinoff of uh, Go- the Goldbergs. Um, mm-hmm. And yeah, so I, we're doing that kind of stuff. Uh, it all depends on which show is happening, but I'm doing a lot of camera work with that. And then on the side, to have some fun, I've been doing that Bathroom Break podcast, which has been on hold for a little while right now during this uh, during the pandemic. Because I was, you know, I was like, yeah, I really like sitting down with people. But you might be inspiring me now to get it get back going again, because this is still fun. 
sitting here. Uh, I, I like to sit in the same room, but but I can do it this way, man. This will be cool, you know, to get the podcast going again. Absolutely, dude. All right, uh, before I let you go, I'm going to ask you one last question. Um, since I didn't know that you were a new father, um, what is something that's changed about you ever since you became a dad? Um, I would have to say uh, at least like I would say even when my wife got pregnant, but when, but when, especially when, she, when our daughter got here, it kind of puts things into perspective in terms of like what really matters, you know, and, and, and I, there's a, there's a certain drive for certain things and you feel like fulfillment's going to come from these outside things. But, but once like my daughter arrived, I really realized my purpose. And so for me, that has changed kind of I've been able to put things into perspective in terms of how much like you know like say I didn't get a piece of footage that day that I wanted to film and uh and try and edit something together I would normally beat myself up or like be like man I need to get back to that god damn you know and like just going after it and trying to get that or be disappointed that I didn't do it and now I can kind of go you know what but I get to come home to the smiling face and do this and I'll get it tomorrow you know what I mean? And, 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 and more and relax a little bit more with that because it sort of does force you to slow down a little bit and, uh, and then kind of uh, prioritize things of what's important. And uh, so that's, that's changed with me a lot. I think, you know, um, we just actually moved back to our hometown, Westchester. Um, I lived in Los Angeles for a lot of years and we just moved back here to be near our family. And that's put family into perspective, you know, because, um, with this little girl, man, we wanted her to be around her grandparents and her cousins and her aunts and uncles. Yep. And, and that's, that's been become really important. And before what was really important is, is chasing the dream um, and being out in LA and being in the mix and doing all that. And, and I had such an amazing time doing that. And I've, I've had a very, uh, very fun life and, and I'm looking for a lot more fun. And, and I think, you know, you know, the feeling with, with your child, you're like, dude, I'm psyched to show her, all the little things like whatever it's old Disney movies or old things that you were psyched on when you were a kid yeah. and to get to experience that again through their eyes. Absolutely, man. So, uh, Chris, I want to thank you so much for being on my show. Um, you are absolutely awesome. Uh, you made uh, one of my dreams come true, man. If, if you would have told me when I was 14 that uh, I'd be talking to Rav himself, I would have told you you were crazy. <laughs> So, yeah. I, I, I want you. I want to think, say thank you for um, letting a, a little, a little radio guy like me uh, talk to you and have this awesome conversation, dude. Dude, well, thanks for having me on. You're you're amazing. You're doing awesome things, and I'm excited to hear Twisted Sister and the interview from that because that that's that's rad as hell. And and dude, you're doing awesome things, and, and it's my it's, it's my my honor to be be able to be a part of this with you. And, and I appreciate you reaching out to me and and, and considering me to do it. Absolutely, dude. Um